Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on how to make a game using the programming language Java and the graphics tool processing. If you are new to Java or processing, I recommend that you start with the first six videos in the sequence that introduces you to the tool and the programming language. We will be building off of concepts from those videos, and we will be using some of the code that's already written as a starting point. So here we are in processing, and I'm starting from a little bit of starter code written in the beginner videos in this series. So what we have is just a little bit of player movement. We can move this rectangle around with the arrow keys, and it, it cannot leave the screen. It also can pick up these coins by colliding with them. And I'm going to start just by walking through what's in this code so far, and I'm going to add comments to it. Uh, again, if you want to see step-by-step -step how this code is written, you can go back through the beginner uh, tutorial steps for this. So if we take a look over here in our code, and while I'm walking through this, I am going to add comments to it. Comments are really useful for programmers to be able to document their code so that other programmers can see what's going on and also so they remember when they come back to it later. If you come back to your own code after a couple of weeks or a couple of months and you can't remember what it does, comments can help you figure out what you were thinking when you first wrote it. So up here at the top, we have our variables. These first two are uh, X and Y are the position of character controller and that is just represented by a rectangle right now and we might change that later. That is what X and Y represent and the starting values for those are 200 and 100 and that is where the player starts. So right now the player will always start at the same spot on the screen. Um, comments in Java are denoted with two slashes like this and so everywhere we want to add a comment we'll start with two slashes. Comments are ignored when the code is run so anything we put in a comment does not affect what is running with our code. If we ever wanted to uh, temporarily disable some of our code you can also use the two slashes to temporarily disable your code by making it a comment. Uh, this next dx and dy, this is how we are changing the x and y position. So this is change in x and y for movement. So that is the variables that handles the movement. And we also have a variable for the speed of movement. And then this w and h is the width and height of the player character, which is just a rectangle right now. We also have a variable to keep track of uh, how many items we have collected. And we can use this for a, a win condition if we wanted to have the player needs to collect a certain number of items to progress to the next level. This would be the way that we would do that. This next thing is an array of coin objects. Uh, so these are the coins that are being displayed on the screen. So that's these coins right here. Next is our setup function, which runs once right at the beginning. And it sets up our screen size to 400 by 500 and a background color of gray. Now, it is usually not necessary to write a comment for every single line, and so I'm going to use comments just a little bit more sparingly moving forward through the rest of the code file. So next we have a while loop that sets up the positions of our coins. And then we have our draw call, which is run every frame. So it's run 60 times per second as the default. And uh, it redraws our background, so it clears whatever was previously being drawn. And then we call the update method on our coins uh, so that we can draw the coins on the screen. Next, we change our fill color to white so that we can draw our player character. And then we checked the uh, edges of the rectangle to see if our updated X and Y position would be outside of the boundaries of the screen. So uh, these two check uh, the boundaries of the screen against the updated X and Y values. And the purpose of this is to only update the X and Y values if we are not going outside the edges of the screen. So this will prevent us from leaving the edges of the screen. And then lastly, we draw the player rectangle. 
and this used the x position minus half of the width of the rectangle, and so this allows us to consider x and y to be the center points of the rectangle for other calculations that we are doing, like collecting the coins, and it uses the w and h variables for the width and height of the rectangle so that we could specify different sizes up here at the top, and I'm going to go ahead and actually make the uh, player character smaller right now. I'm going to make these 30 by 30 uh, because moving forward I actually want a smaller player character. Making the character uh, smaller makes it essentially feel like your play space is larger and since we don't have a visual representation of our character yet uh, it uh, doesn't have any impact on the, the visual perception of the character. So this is just giving us a sense of more playable space. Uh, so then the next things that we did down here was we handled keyboard input for pressing arrow keys and to do this we uh, we updated our change in y and change in x using our speed variable so that we are only specifying speed in one place up at the top and then we use that speed everywhere we are going to adjust the to the change in x and change in y so we use a negative speed for moving upward because higher numbers on the screen are lower y values and then positive speed to move down uh, negative speed to move left and positive speed to move right then on the key release we are handling uh, keyboard input for releasing arrow keys uh, to um, reset our change in y or change in x to zero uh, depending on which keyboard key was released. And this allows us to have smooth continuous motion for our player character and also to be able to move at a diagonal. So if we press both the right and left keys, uh, the right and up keys at the same time, we will move at a diagonal. So that's it for the main program so far. And the last thing to show is the coin class, uh, which has the attributes of the coin, which is the X and Y position of the coin, which are specified by the constructor. So the constructor takes an X and Y value to spawn a coin. And we are always setting our active state to true when we create a new coin. The active state is used by the update method to only draw the coin if it is active. And then inside of this active state, we are drawing a yellow coin at the X and Y position specified, and then running a distance check to see if player collides. And so this is using the X and Y uh, of the player character, and then the X and Y of the coin, and it is checking if it is less than half of the width of the player, plus 10, and so this 10 is half of the width of the coin, and so this detects if there is a collision, and it calls the collect method, which adds one to our total number of collected, uh, and then it prints out the result, and it sets this coin to active state to false, so that it is no longer being drawn. And if we run this, we can see the collected value being printed out, it prints out in the console down here, so every time we pick up a coin, we can see how many coins we have collected, and that is printed out down here. So we have the starting point of a playable character controller and a basic mechanic of collecting things. So now to turn this into a game, what we need to do is to convey information to the player of what their goal is, which is to collect the coins, and also what is their progress towards that goal we need to introduce some kind of ch danger or challenge to prevent the player from just completing the level immediately. And we need to add some win and lose conditions so that the player has the ability to either win or lose the game or both. And once we have all of those building blocks, we will then introduce progressive difficulty by having different levels that introduce different amounts of challenge. After that, the next consideration to make would be how to add player agency and give them the impression of having impact on the world as well as supporting different playstyles. So in order to give the player information about what their goal is as well as their progress towards the goal, I want to add some on-screen text. Right now we're just displaying how many coins are collected here in the console, but the player does not have access to the console, only the programmer does. So in order to convey that information to the player, we need to create some on-screen text. And we will do that by first creating a P font, 
which I will call f. So this is a variable of type p font, which will allow us to specify some font information and then draw text to the screen. In the setup, I am going to uh, create this font using create font and then specifying the font to use, which I'll use Arial size 16. And the last parameter this takes is a true false value for anti-aliasing, which I'm going to use true. And then we are going to set up our text, which will use this font that we have created called F. And uh, we can also specify a different size for the font for when we're, when we're drawing, anytime we're ready to draw text to the screen, we can change the font size this way. So I will set this font size to 36 and we'll draw the text to the screen at the end of our draw call. So this will go after our rectangle. We'll actually put any UI elements we want to, to use, we will put at the bottom of our draw call because the bottom of the draw call will be things that are drawn in front, uh, closest to the screen essentially. And so we want UI elements to generally always be on top of the gameplay. So we will draw our text here. And just to show the how we can draw text to the screen, I'm just gonna draw the word text for just a moment. And then we specify the position where we want to draw it. Let's try 20 and 100. And let's just take a look at that. So here is the text that I am drawing. So I probably want to change the color before I draw this. Just like with drawing shapes, we use fill to specify a fill color. And so if I change this to black for my text, now I will see it appear as black text. I can also now replace this text with the number of coins collected. And we can just put the, the variable here, collected. And now it will just display a number and it starts out at zero. And if we go around and collect the coins, uh, now I can see it is going up. And this is, this is great. So we can see how many we've collected, but it would be nice for this to explain a little bit to the player what this number represents. And also so they know how many, uh, how many coins they can collect. So I'm gonna come up to the top and instead of setting 10 here, I am going to make a new variable called total coins. And I'm gonna set this equal to 10 and then I'm going to use that for creating my array so that I can now use this variable when I am displaying my information to the screen. So now, now in this text call, what I want to add here is coins collected and I'm gonna use the plus to concatenate. So this allows us to concatenate multiple things together in the same string. And uh, so I'm gonna have, let me add a space here. And so I'll have the number collected and I want to essentially show that this is out of, so I'm gonna use the slash here and then total coins. And so this will convey to the player how many coins they have collected and how many they can collect. And so now we see coins collected at zero out of 10. And so as I'm going around and picking these up, I can see that it's going up. And so as the player, now I know what my goal is, it's to get 10 coins and uh, I can see when I have accomplished that goal. So that's important information for the player. I think I wanna make this font a little bit smaller since it's taking up a lot of my screen right now. So I'm going to go back to my setup where I am setting this up and let's just try a font size of 26 instead. And so now this is a much more reasonable size and I can still go around and pick up all the coins and I can tell when I have accomplished my goal. So our next step is to introduce some danger and challenge. So I'm going to add a new tab for a new class, which I am going to call trap. And so this will allow me to make traps in my game. So create a new class, just like we did with the coin class. And similar to the coin class, we want a uh, X and Y position for our traps. Um, and then we will add some additional uh, functionality so the traps can uh, do some damage to the player and and have a cooldown time. So just to start things off, let's add a float for trap X and a float for trap Y. And then we'll write our constructor, which will take an X position and a Y position. And we will use those to set up 
our trap X and our trap Y. Then we need an update call to draw our traps to the screen. And we'll give these a red color. And then we will draw them as a rectangle. And we'll use the trap X and trap Y, but I'm going to subtract half of the width uh, and height of the rectangle for the trap, which is going to be, it's going to be a 20 by 20 rectangle. So uh, trap X minus 10 and trap Y minus 10. And then the size will be 20 by 20. And then uh, in order for this to function like a trap, we need to detect when the player collides. So we're gonna do another distance check, just like we did with the coin. So we're gonna check X and Y of the player and X and Y of the trap. And we're gonna say if this is less than 25, then I want to uh, I want to cause some negative consequence for the player. For now, just to demonstrate what's happening, I am going to subtract one from the number of things collected. So essentially you're running around collecting coins and if you step on a trap, you drop some of your coins. And so that's the functionality that I want to work with. So uh, let's just start with that and then add our traps into uh, our main program so we can uh, see how that functionality works. And we're gonna see some problems with it, which we'll address in a moment. But let's start by adding these in. So up at the top, I'm going to make an array of traps, just like we did with the coins. So this is gonna follow a very similar format. So we'll make five traps to start with. And then in my setup function, I am going to, first I'm going to, I'm gonna reuse the I, the incrementer I'm using in this while loop. I'm gonna reset it to zero. And then I am going to use while I is less than five to set up my traps. Now, as I have mentioned before, you can certainly use a for loop here instead. I am just using a while loop to demonstrate that you can use both of them. And so I'll use a for loop down in my draw call but up here I'm using a while loop and this is not in any way any sort of convention. This is just to demonstrate that they both work. So uh, I am going to show you a while loop here for the traps. So we'll do trap of I equals new trap and we'll give it a random value just like we did with the coins. So I'm really matching this up here pretty closely. So uh, we'll set our random from zero to width and another one from zero to height. And don't forget I plus plus so that we are incrementing our value of I each time. And I missed an S here, so it should be traps of I. Uh, so this will create our traps and then we also need to draw our traps and we're gonna do that in the exact same way as we do with the coin. And so I'm going to, again, use a for loop here. And once again, this could also be a while loop. And this is just to show that both loops uh, can have the desired functionality. So this is for trap T in traps, T dot update. And that will draw our traps on the screen. And so now when I run this, now I have traps appearing on the screen. And when I step on the trap, what happens is it that I'm losing coins continuously while I'm stepping on it. So I can pick up coins and gain one each time, but when I'm standing on a trap, for one, I can go below zero, and for another thing, I uh, am losing coins continuously. So let's go ahead and address that in our trap class by adding a cooldown so that when we step on a trap, uh, it will take away one coin initially, and then it won't damage us again uh, for a, a moment or two. So I'm gonna add some new attributes at the top. I'm gonna make one called cooldown. This will be how long our cooldown is and we can adjust this value later. I'm just gonna start with four for now. Then we need another one, uh, which is going to be a timer for us. So I'm going to use uh, the, the name cool timer for this. And then we need a Boolean value uh, for when we are on our cooldown. And I'm gonna start this equal to false. I don't want the 
Uh, initially, I don't want the traps to be on cooldown, although I might change my mind about this later. I might decide that I don't want any of the, the traps active until uh, a few moments after the player has started the level. So we'll, we'll come back to that and revisit that design decision later. So now in my update, before I draw the rectangle, I am going to check if on cooldown. So if my trap is currently on cooldown, I want to change my fill color to let the player know that the trap is on cooldown. So I'll do 45, 100, 100. So this will be a blue greenish color. And uh, while I'm on cooldown, I'm also going to be updating my timer. Now, um, the timer, we haven't set it up yet, so uh, you can't really see how uh, this is going to be going down from, but we will be subtracting from it on each frame. So on each frame, I'm going to subtract one divided by frame rate, and this will, uh, this will cause our cooldown timer to go down on every frame. And then if our cooldown timer is less than or equal to zero, then our cooldown is done. So if this is the case, then we will set on cooldown equal to false. And this is a nested if condition, so we only want to uh, handle this condition with the cooldown timer if we are currently on cooldown. So the nested if will only happen if we are inside of the big if condition. So then we draw the rectangle and then uh, I'm going to adjust our distance check. I'm going to first check that we are not on cooldown. And uh, so this exclamation point means not. And so it, this is a Boolean value. Uh, this should be on cooldown. Uh, so this is a Boolean value and the exclamation point reverses it. So if cooldown is true, then not cooldown is false and vice versa. The double ampersands lets us check two conditions at once. So I'm saying this condition and also this distance check. Uh, so if both of those are true, uh, then we update our collected. And then um, since, we, since we are currently not on cooldown, so the trap is active and we stepped on it. So now we are on cooldown. So we'll set on cooldown equal to true. And here's where we set up our cool timer. So our cool timer, we want to use whatever is specified as our cooldown time. So this is the uh, maximum amount of time for the cooldown. So we'll set equal to cooldown. So now when we test this out, when we step on a trap, we'll lose one, so we went down to negative one. And if I pick one back up, now I'm back up to zero. And if I step on a trap again, I can see, so it turns this blue-green color, and if I keep stepping on it while it's that color, I don't lose any coins. So it stays on cooldown for four seconds, and I could change the cooldown time if I wanted to. Um, I could also have the color change gradually to give the player a little bit more information about um, how long the trap is on cooldown. Right now, there's, it's not really clear to the player when it's going to turn back. So giving the player a little bit of extra visual feedback there might help. Um, one way we could do that is we could have a little number above it or on top of it that shows the cooldown. Um, alternatively, we could have it gradually changing color over time. The one problem with having the gradual change in color over time is if you are trying to have uh, your game be colorblind friendly, that can be a little bit difficult to detect. Um, there are other ways that we could convey this visually, but I will go ahead and show the gradual color change, uh, but you could do this in a, a variety of different ways. So to do the color change over time for indicating when the trap is on cooldown, I'm gonna add a couple of new color variables at the top. I'm gonna have one called start color, which is a color type object and the color is 185 10 0 this is my start color and I could right away I'm gonna go down to where I'm setting my fill color down here and I could replace this with my start color so that I am no longer hard coding my color variable there uh, then I'm going to have another 
color variable called cooldown color, which is the other color I'm using, which is sort of a blue green color, 45, 100, 100. And um, just to show another way of doing this uh, to, to demonstrate when the traps are on cooldown with um, a less color specific way, I'm actually going to also go ahead and uh, change the width of the rectangle. So I'm going to have the rectangle will um, become smaller and then it will grow back to its normal size uh, when it is done being on cooldown. So I'm going to make a float for my W for my width of my rectangle and I'm going to start that equal to 20 as the default and then I'm also going to have a max width which is what is my normal size which is also 20. Now inside of my cooldown uh, where I am setting my cooldown color here instead of hard coding the color I'm going to have this be a lerp color. Lerp is linear interp interpolation which means that it is uh, moving continuously between two values. You can use lerp for different things besides color, um, but I'm going to use a lerp color uh, to, to gradually transition between two colors. And the two colors I'm going to use are the cooldown color and the start color. And the way a lerp works is you give it the two values, the, the what you're transitioning from and what you're transitioning to. So this is gonna go from my cooldown color to my start color. So it's gonna transition from blue to red. And the last uh, variable that you put in here, or the last parameter rather, is um, a value between zero and one of how much it should be towards either of these. So starting at zero, it will be this color, and starting at one, it will be this color. And so we're gonna go gradually from zero to one. And to achieve that, I am going to use my cool timer divided by cooldown. So cooldown is my total amount that I'm cooling down by. That is this uh, four value here. And then cool timer is the thing that's updating. And so cool timer uh, starts equal to cooldown and then counts downward. Since I'm counting downward, that means this is going to uh, actually start at one and gradually go down to zero. And instead of starting at one and going down to zero, I want to reverse that. So I'm going to use one minus my cooldown uh, calculation. So this will start from zero and move to one. So it will use my colors correctly. Um, and then I need to add an extra parenthesis in here because this is the close parenthesis for lerp color. And this is the close parenthesis for my fill. Uh, so now this is going to use a gradually transitioning color as the fill color while I'm on cooldown. The other thing I'm going to do while I'm on cooldown is I'm going to set this W value and I'm going to set this equal to max width times and I'm actually going to use this same value, 1 minus cool timer divided by cooldown. So this is going to adjust my width from 0 to my normal width size. And I'll put this in parentheses so that it does the full one minus before it multiplies by the max width. And then I'm going to use this W when I draw my rectangle. So uh, by default, this is going to be 20 when I start, and then it will update whenever I'm on cooldown. So let's see this in action. So now when I step on one of the traps, I can see it turns blue and also gets smaller while it's on cooldown and it doesn't go back to being active until it returns to red and its full size. So now I have visual feedback for the player to know when it's safe to step on a trap. Visual feedback is really important in games as well as audio feedback. We'll be adding audio feedback in a little bit, uh, but it is really important to be able to convey information to the player and to let them know what is happening, especially if it is something that can harm the player, like the traps. We want to be really clear about when it is safe and when it is not safe. Now, I'm going to quickly do a couple of little cleanup things. I want my text to be higher up on the screen, so it's sort of bound to the top of the screen. And I also want to make sure that my coins and my traps aren't going directly behind the text because then it's a little bit difficult to see what's going on. Uh, I also don't want them going off of the edge of the screen. So I'm going to make just a couple of minor adjustments where I am spawning my coins. 
uh, for the uh, and for and the traps for the the x value. I am going to start at twenty and uh, have my width uh, be minus twenty. So so this is going to add a little bit of buffer space around the edges. For the Y value, let me first move my text. So my text is being drawn at 20 and 100. So I'm gonna change this to 20 and 20. So now it is being drawn just at the top of the screen. And let me just take a look at that. Uh, it's actually a little bit too high. So I'm going to bring that down to 30. And that looks pretty good. And so now I want to make sure that my coins and traps are not spawning behind that text. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, and one other thing that you may have noticed there, I was actually spawning on top of a trap. And so to prevent that from happening, I'm also gonna change my player start spawning location. Um, so I'm gonna make sure traps and coins spawn below the text. And then I'm actually gonna spawn the player character up here next to the text. So let's first adjust the coins and traps. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, 60 uh, for the start and then height minus 20. So the 60 is to add a buffer space at the top and then minus 20 adds just a little bit of buffer space at the bottom. And then lastly, I'm going to change my player start X and Y to be uh, at the end of where the text is spawning. So um, my X uh, value is going to be, uh, let's try 300 for X and 20 for Y. And let's see how that looks. All right, maybe just a little farther over. So I'm gonna do 340 for X. All right, and so now I don't have to worry about my uh, player spawning on top of traps and I also don't have to worry about traps or coins spawning behind the text uh, So just visually I think that will help clean things up just a little next I want to separate my damage from my Collectibles so that I can have the traps cause damage out of a health system. So I'm going to add uh, a, Another set of variables down here for my health system and so I'm going to have a max health, which I'll say is 100. And my current health, which I'll just call health. And it will also start equal to 100. And then I will um, be updating this one uh, when, when the player takes damage. Uh, I'm also going to add a... A variable called damage, which will be the amount of damage that the traps will cause. Uh, so then in my traps, what I can do is when the player steps on the trap, and that is happening right here, instead of subtracting from the collected, I can say health minus equals damage, and it will pull from the damage variable that I specified up here. Um, Probably this is a variable I would want to move to the traps. That way I can have other things that cause different amounts of damage. But for now, I'm just going to keep it in my main program as uh, the damage variable. So I update the health and I'm going to go ahead and add a print line that shows my current health so I can see that that is working. And now, when I step on a trap, I can see my current health is 88. Uh, so I subtracted 12 from the default of 100. Now it's 64. Now it's down to 40. And so then the next thing I want to do is add uh, a condition where the health drops below zero. Um, and then I'm also going to, um, I'm going to display it with a health bar above the player. And then I'm also going to set a win condition when the coins collected equals 10. And then I will have a win screen and a lose screen that this will go to. So um, to set that up, let's uh, let's add into, I'm gonna start with the lose screen. So I'm going to add win and lose screens. Um, and these will just be 
booleans. Uh, so I'll have a windscreen and a lose screen. And the and then uh, the way that I'm going to use these is in my draw call. So I have um, all of the code that's in my draw call right now is being displayed during the main part of the game. Um, and so if I wanted to change what's being displayed in the draw call, depending on the screen that I'm in, I could have up here if windscreen, then whatever I put in here will be my display for my windscreen. And then else if lose screen. So if one of these two is true, then I will do the display specific to those screens. And then I'm gonna do else. And I'm gonna have all of the rest of my current draw code in this else. And I will update the indentation. Uh, just select it all and tab it all over and so it all lines up with this else block. So now all of the regular game code is happening in this else block. So let me uh, go back up to my booleans and let me make sure these both are starting out as false. And then in my, uh, in my trap, I can check when I update the health if health is less than or equal to zero, then I can set lose screen equal to true. And so let's take a look at that. So my health is going down. And okay, so what happened here is now everything is frozen and I'm no longer taking input. So it's no longer updating what it's drawing, um, but I'm not drawing anything over it. So now what I want to do is I want to draw over what was previously there. Everything is, is frozen right now, which is the functionality that I want. Um, but I want to draw something here. So first I'm going to change the background. Let's say black and then Let's change the fill color to white. And let's set some text on our screen to you lose. And I am going to, uh, I'm gonna center this. So I, I want to uh, adjust my text align to center and here I can put width over two and height over two. Uh, so now this should center the text in the middle of the screen. So now let's get our health down to zero. And there we go. So now we have a lose screen. So next let's set up the win screen and I'm gonna go ahead and take out my print line for my health since this is now uh, done. I'm done um, working on my health and damage system for right now. So I don't need the, the print lines happening anymore. And in my coin, I am going to check, I'm gonna get rid of the print line for my collected. And instead I'm going to say if collected is greater than or equal to, um, I forget what my variable was called. Let's pop back over here, total coins. So I wanna check, I'm not using 10 cause I might change this value. So I wanna see if it's greater than or equal to total coins. If so, then I say windscreen equals true. And now I can collect all the coins and I don't have anything being drawn in my windscreen yet. So now I need to set up my windscreen. And I'm gonna copy and paste what I have for my lose screen and I'm just gonna change things up a bit. So I'll change this to say, you win. I'm going to change my background to 255 and my text color to zero. Um, just so it's really obviously different between the two. So now I will 
come around and pick up all of these coins. And now I have the you win screen. So that's my win and lose condition. Now, the one thing that I am not displaying to the player is how much health they have left. So right now they have no idea uh, if their health is in a good place or not. So I am going to update this to include a health bar. So I'm going to add my health bar down in the bottom of my draw call where I'm putting all of my UI. So I am going to add, um, I'm going to add two rectangles. The first one is going to be the background rectangle, which will be um, essentially the empty health bar. And then I will do the foreground rectangle, um, which will be the uh, how much health I currently have. So the background rectangle, let's just uh, let's just set this at 20 and 80 for now, just so we can take a look at it. And the width is going to be my max health. This is the background one. And then for the height, um, let's just do 10 for now. And then we'll draw the foreground one, which is going to be at the same position as the background. And instead of using max health for the width is going to just use health and then it uses the same height. Now, in order to distinguish between these two, I'm gonna make them two different colors. So I'll make the background a red color and I'll make the foreground a green color. And then let's take a look at this. So right now, here's my health bar right here. Not a great position, but we'll update that. And so I can see my health is going down and the green, the filled part, that is what my current health is. And so now the player has feedback of how much health they have left. Now, instead of having it stationary at this corner of the screen, I am actually going to place it above the player. So I'm going to set the X values of both of these to the X of the player. And then for the Y, I am going to have it uh, just above the player. So we'll do Y, let's try Y minus 20 see how that looks and I think the X we're also gonna have to move over a little bit but let's take a look and see all right so uh, that is um, pretty uh, good that it sticks with the player but it is not positioned very well above the player's head so I do want to move it to the left a little bit and I also think that it's quite a bit too long so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to set the width as health and max health. Um, let's do, let's cut it in half. So we'll do divided by two. And uh, then for our X, we're also going to subtract here. So let's do minus 20. And let's see how that looks. All right, that's a lot better. Since I'm dividing both the foreground and the background in half, I, uh, I can be confident that it is still showing the correct uh, percent of the health bar. So when I see it gets just down to that last little sliver, uh, then I know I only have a little bit of health left. Um, I could make it even just a little smaller still, and just to see, um, and then let's set this to 15 and 15 and just play around with it a little bit and see what we think. All right. Uh, I do think I want to raise it up a little bit so that it is farther above the player. And I actually, uh, I think I liked this better being just a little to the left of the player. And let's move it up just a bit. And I also want to make it just a little bit skinnier. So let's do seven and seven for the height. And all right, there's my health bar. Um, I'm going to move it actually just a little bit to the right. So let's do minus 17.5 for that. Value. And I'm going to use F to make this a float. Since we're using decimals, we want these to be floating point values. And um, I think actually I'm going to move it just a smidgen back to the right. So I'm just 
I'm just experimenting with these until I find a value that I like. All right, I think that looks pretty good. And it stays with the player. And so now I have feedback of what is my current health and I know how many coins I have and I have my win and lose conditions. So uh, that is where I'm going to stop for now. And uh, in the next video, I will add some additional types of obstacles and make uh, a progressive difficulty increase, having, uh, having it start out easy and get more difficult as the player goes on. Uh, but for now, we have a win and lose condition. We have a goal. We have feedback for the player. And we have a little bit of a challenge for them. So I hope you found this helpful. And I hope this starts you on your way making your games with Java and processing. Don't forget to like and subscribe.